Welcome to Book Banter with me, your host, Diane Burkhardt. I hope you will join me every Wednesday as we explore all things to do with, well, (laughs) books. Let's get on with our show today. Hello, my happy people. Unfortunately, today is not a particularly happy day. We are on September 11th. And for those of you who remember, this is the day when the Twin Towers were brought down by an attack. Our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone who was affected by this tragedy. In the aftermath of the attack, it brought a nation together and helped define the way that many people saw themselves as American citizens. We will always remember September 11th. It seems a bit odd to go on and be really happy about a guest whenever we do have this memorial today, but we do have a fantastic guest for you today, and he is amazing. If you have ever wondered what it is like for somebody who holds people's lives in their hands on a daily basis, this is definitely the author for you to follow. After a long career as a transplant specialist, he wrote a memoir called Exhale, and then went on to write fiction. Please welcome to Book Banter with Diane Burkhart, the incredible David Weil. The way that I usually start these shows, I don't do a lot of preamble during the interview. I do all that later. So we just start out with our guest telling our audience who you are and what you do. My name is David Weil. I spent most of my career as a transplant doctor, most of that time at Stanford, where I led the lung transplant program there. I took a career shift several years ago when I left in 2016, moved back to New Orleans and opened a consulting business where I help transplant programs that are having trouble. And I also started writing about some of the experiences I saw in the hospital. I published my first book in 2021, a memoir about the emotional roller coaster of doing this kind of work, and then came out with a novel called All That Really Matters that is also hospital-based, but also touches on some of the themes about doing this kind of work. You know, I have to say, I'm, I'm very impressed with anybody who has such a long career in medicine. My father had been a nurse at one time and wanted me to follow in his footsteps. So I went and volunteered at a hospital for a while to see if it was something I wanted to do. And just one month told me that was not something I was going to do because I got too wrapped up emotionally in everything I saw. How difficult is it for you to compartmentalize what you're doing with your patients and not taking that home to your family? You know, at the beginning of my career, and I started working in hospitals when I was 15, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm the only son of a uh, nurse and a doctor. And so I started being interested in medicine when I was very young. I always really liked being in the hospital. I liked the environment. I still like walking into one. I I feel safe and comfortable there. But uh, to your question, I think it was easier when I was younger to actually emotionally detach from what was going on in the hospital. There were really two things as I grew older that happened to me that sort of broke down that emotional detachment. The first was when my father received a liver transplant very early in my career, and it made me look at the whole field differently. It was no more theoretically transplanting somebody. Every somebody was somebody's father, mother, daughter, wife. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing was having children of my own. And I was actually taking care of a lot of young people and what I did. And I couldn't help but see my kids in those young people. And so I think at that point, I started to really emotionally connect, maybe too much, with the patients that I took care of. And so after about 20 years of doing that kind of work, I decided that I was out of empathy and I had a lot of compassion fatigue Mm -hmm. and decided to step away from the front lines of medicine. Now, I wanted to talk for a moment about your first book, Exhale. I know we're supposed to be focusing on all that really matters, your latest book, but just to give people a bit of a personal view of you, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, when I left Stanford in 2016, I had a lot on my mind. I I had ridden, I think, a real roller coaster there, very high highs and low lows related to taking care of a very sick group of patients. So I tell a lot of patient-related stories and about their courage and resilience and their impact on me. 
But I also tell a lot of stories about the kind of people that do this kind of work and the team dynamic and the ego and the hospital politics and the corporate nature of medicine these days. And I get into all of that in my book. So it started out as I wanted to talk a lot about the patient's that I saw that gave me the education of a lifetime. They taught me so many things. And then I kind of pivoted. And what was really on my mind was how does doing this kind of work impact the people that provide that kind of care? And I kind of give the reader a behind the curtains look at complex medical care and the team dynamic that goes along with that. So that was the emphasis in my first book. How did you interact with a lot of your patients? Because there's something that's so different about transplant practices because somebody's life depends on somebody else dying usually. Yeah, I think that that's right. I I think there. I've always looked at transplant as all the best and worst of medicine, very concentrated (laughs) into Mm -hmm. one. And you're right. I mean, there's a lot of moral and ethical dilemmas in transplant. Yes, somebody has to pass away to to save another person that they don't know. And I had to actually hope that we got a donor one night for one of our waiting patients. And I knew that in order for one of my patients to get transplanted, somebody else had to have a tragedy and somebody else's family was suffering. So it was a real kind of split screen in your own mind about what was really happening. And I think that that's just one of the many ethical and moral challenges in doing this kind of work. And I try to put that on the page. I think that that just adds a whole nother layer of stress and anxiety to a career that already comes with stress and anxiety. Whenever you're dealing with saving people's lives, that's one thing. But whenever you have to actually deal with people losing their lives so you can save somebody else's life, that's a whole other level. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we would wait for holiday weekends and things where we knew people were out and about and the traffic fatalities were going up and bad behavior was going up and things that would make somebody an organ donor all increased during that time period. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it sounds very callous, and I suppose it is. But at the same time, I walked around for 20 years with a list of names in my pocket mm-hmm. that needed a transplant to yeah. survive. And I knew those people very well. I knew their families very well. I knew their dog's name and everything else. And, you know, someone was going to have to have a tragedy for me to take one of those names off of my list. And, you know, it was a heavy responsibility. It was never lost on me that it was a heavy responsibility. And sometimes I wore it well and sometimes not so well. And I write about both in my first book. So now that you had your memoir, Exhale, out, what made you decide to move to fiction? I felt like I had gone pretty far in my memoir about getting into the more systemic problems in what we did and do in healthcare. I felt like I had left a little bit of unsaid, and mm-hmm. I wanted to get more into it. And you know how it is. I, I think fiction allows more latitude to explore some of these topics in depth Mm -hmm. without the risk of offending somebody or an institution having problems with what you said. And there's always patient confidentiality Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And so I felt like the freedom that writing fiction allowed me was very liberating. And it was really a lot of fun. Writing the memoir was really opening the artery on the page, as it were, Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that way with the novel. I I felt like I was having fun Mm -hmm. writing. So my third book is going to go back to nonfiction. I'm already starting that. But I think I'm going to return to fiction because I want that feeling of freedom, that unencumbered feeling that I'm sure a lot of writers have. A lot of writers do tend to put a lot of themselves even in their fiction writing. How much of you is in All That Really Matters? You know, I think there's some of me in the main character. There's some other people in the other characters. There's no one person that's exactly like one person that I encountered during the course of my career, but there were all combinations of people. And one thing about our field is it it draws pretty interesting people to it, you know, to want to do this kind of work. So 
the settings that I set up and the characters that I set up are not science fiction. I mean, they, they, they happen in, you know, in real life and all of what's in my novel happened in real life. But I really wasn't even familiar with the term autofiction when I wrote this book. I became familiar with it, which I suppose has, you know, as the name implies, fictional elements, but an autobiographical story. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's quite that. I'm different in some important ways from the main character. But I think the similarities are such that, and this happens with everybody's life, your career or your life could have taken a right turn instead of took a left, or it could have taken a left turn and turn instead of took a right. I think you do see that in this book. I think you see things that could have, might have, possibly could have happened to me, but really didn't. You mm-hmm. know, I think that that's an important distinction. The ups and the downs that Dr. Joe Bosco, the protagonist, got into, I didn't really have in my career. Was that an opportunity for you to just play what if? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think that we all walk up to door number one or door (laughs) number two, and sometimes we take one door or the other, and Dr. Bosco took some doors that I did not take, and, you know, I can't help but think, you know, what if I had? and. Mm -hmm life would be pretty different. But that was the joy of it, really, is being able to explore somebody that had some similarities. He, he was a transplant doctor, so was I. He spent some time in New Orleans, so did I. He liked to ride his bike, said why. Uh, all these sorts of things. But when it came down to the big decisions that he had to make, our lives weren't exactly the same. They, in fact, weren't particularly close. Why don't you go ahead and give us a synopsis of All That Really Matters? Sure. As I mentioned, it's a story of a protagonist, a heart and lung transplant surgeon named Dr. Joseph Bosco. And Joe has a steep rise in his career and then an equally uh, steep decline. He gets himself into trouble and is looking for redemption during the course of, of the novel. He has a love interest that I think is also important named Kate, who is a physician as well. And she has a different career path, as many female physicians do, than their male counterparts. And I wanted to look at the interaction between the two of them to make a broader point about the differences in gender in healthcare and how male physicians often have a different path than female ones. And he was a person that had very high expectations put on him. And one of the main themes in the book is, what do we do with the expectations that we have in life, those that are put on us and those that we have for ourselves? And that's basically what the novel journeys through. And I really had a great time exploring all of this. In the book, Joe's father is portrayed as a Holocaust survivor. What was it that prompted you to have this character be a Holocaust survivor? Well, that, that is one similarity that he and I have. My father was a Holocaust survivor. I have a very ambiguous background. My father immigrated to this country in 1939 as a German Jewish, persecuted, you know, a lot of family members in concentration camps, including my grandfather. And he married a Southern Baptist woman from Selma, Alabama, of civil rights fame. And I've always been interested, I'm interested in the Holocaust generally, Mm -hmm. but but I'm also interested in religious identity and how it impacts our behaviors. And I set up a situation in the book where I think Joe is at times trying to prove not only that he's worthy of his father's affection, but he's also worthy of the world's affection. And I think in studying the first and second generation of Holocaust survivors, there seems to be a a common theme that they're constantly trying to prove their worth to the world. And it's something that I'm really intensely interested in. And I'm actually going to write about that in my third book. It's, It's a big part of the third book that I'm working on now. Have you ever visited Germany? I have. uh, I, I have actually a few times. And then fairly recently with my oldest daughter, we went to Berlin where my father grew up and had a really meaningful experience. And 
it fascinates me. You know, the whole situation uh, pre-war, during the war, of course, and afterwards really fascinates me. Uh, and my family has a 600-year history there going oh, back wow. to 1320. And um, all uh, rabbis, up until my grandfather, who turned his back on religion and moved to Berlin and went for a more secular life. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how things progressed in my family, but it's an old family. It's 600 years old. That's incredible. One of the things that I can tell you as an immigrant here to Germany, I had to take their immigration courses. And part of that was learning German history. And they are very adamant about teaching about Holocaust. They want to show all of their dirty laundry so that people who come here know what actually happened. It was very shocking to me that they were so adamant about teaching people who come here all of the horrible things that happened here in Germany. I've heard that, actually, and, and it's really great, great to hear. Um, you know, I, I don't have any firsthand experience, of course, living there, but I have come to understand that they're very open about it. And certainly, as I've kind of visited some of the sites that I'm interested in, I have German guides and so forth, and they've been really great about it, trying to educate me about mm -hmm. the German attitude toward all of what happened there. And I think it's great. Uh, I really do. I'm glad to hear your insights about it because I know that you do live there. So. Well, I was very impressed with this, that there being so many people in the world today that are Holocaust deniers, the fact that the government here is adamant about making sure that the history is taught correctly for what actually happened, I do admire them for that. Because so many countries will try to whitewash the things that they did that were horrible in the past, and they don't. They don't want it to happen again. I think that's great. I, I really do. And yeah, I, I've certainly seen on social media the Holocaust denier movement and things that are going on in this country even. You know, it's very concerning. And I think it's worth everyone's attention. That's the important thing. I think as we learned in the Holocaust, certainly, you know, turning your back on the situation, whether you're in Germany at the time or whether you were even in this country at the time is, is really dangerous. I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. I know that since you left actually working as a transplant doctor, you have not really left that field so much. You're still doing a lot of consulting. Yeah, I tell you, you know, and I say this with all humility, I love transplant. I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's amazing. I also had to make the very tough decision not to practice it anymore. That was very difficult. It was a personal decision that was best for me and best for my family. And I had to put that above everything else. And I wanted to stay connected to the field because I haven't lost one ounce of affection for it. But I feel like in helping programs perform better, whether they're new ones or old ones, I can then help patients that way. And it's the best thing that I can do at this stage of the game is to be more coach than quarterback, but still take what I've learned over the years and try to help these programs perform better. And I'm gratified. I really, truly am gratified that I'm able to do it, that folks want my opinion. I wasn't sure when I left Stanford, for instance, that my relevance would be still there. And fortunately, I still have a voice and folks look to me to give them recommendations and, and help them out. And that's lucky. You know, I, I feel very good about that. Well, I think you definitely had a voice, especially considering that you have been in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee twice. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've enjoyed, and I think Part of this is just my background is weighing in on issues that concern me. And I think it's important that we do that, whether it's the written forum, whether it's standing up in front of an audience, giving a talk, whether or not it's testifying in the Senate. I think it's really important that we don't just sit by and sit in the stands <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think we need to get on the playing field. <laughs> you can tell there's not a sports metaphor I haven't loved. <laughs> you know, I think that there's a little bit too much of that, I think. I hear, you know, and I don't know if social media is helping that or hurting that, but there's a lot of folks just kind of squawking. And I think that what we need to do 
is we need to get people to engage on the issues that they care about. And I try to do that, whether it's the written or spoken form. Now you said you're starting on your third book. What is your process like whenever you start a new project? I don't know how I categorize what I do. I'll tell you what I do, though. I mean, I don't know if it's interesting or novel for that matter, but I'm looking at it right now. I have a big bulletin board with three by five index cards. I I think there's other people that must do this. Mm -hmm. I know a few. (laughs) Yeah, I I think it's really common. I'm not sure where I picked it up, and I'm sure I stole it from somebody. Um, (laughs) You know, basically, when I have an idea for a scene, it goes on a three by five card, and then it becomes a big puzzle and I'm moving the cards around. So all of my books are done that way. I don't type out an outline, nor do I just start writing from scratch. It's all me and the bulletin board. And right now I'm in the bulletin board phase with this (laughs) third book. And it's actually kind of fun because I stand there and I look at the cards and have music on in the background. And I try to think about how I'm going to put this puzzle together, because I think writing books is as much this kind of problem solving and decision making as anything else that I've done in my life. So I like this phase, actually. What kind of music do you listen to? I'm a jazz fan. Good choice. (laughs) Yeah, I guess growing up in New Orleans, what choice did I have? Yeah. Um, So I listen to jazz nearly exclusively. And I'm not only a fan of the music itself, I'm a fan of the emotion that it evokes. It's a very emotional music as far as I'm concerned. And my father was a big classical music fan, and he used to sit there and listen to it. And that's, I think, very emotional music too. Mm -hmm. But I tend to gravitate toward jazz and have it on nearly all the time when I'm working and not doing an interview with somebody like you. (laughs) Couldn't hear me otherwise. (laughs) Who are your favorite artists? Well, I have one favorite. I actually am friends with him, and I wrote in the acknowledgement section of both books that he continues to inspire me, and it's Terrence Blanchard, who is from New Orleans. And uh, Terrence, uh, I've known for, I guess, 20 years or so. And his music, I think it's a very high art form that is extremely emotional and haunting in many ways to me. And I think sometimes when I'm digging into these themes of expectations and life and death that I write about, you know, some and religious identity, I need, you know, that kind of deep music mm-hmm. and you know, spiritual in many ways to get the words out of me. So I thank him in both of the books. He wasn't in the room when I was writing either one, except his music was. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am definitely so, going to have to look up his work now because I love yeah. jazz. I usually tend yeah. to gravitate more towards the older female artists yeah. like Bessie yeah. Smith and Nina yeah. Simone, Billie Holiday. Right. right. But yeah, any kind uh, of good jazz works for me. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of different kind of jazz that he's actually turned me on to. There's some young artists that are just dynamite and they're also expanding the definition of jazz, I think. I'm very interested in the Latin music, mm-hmm. you know, Latin jazz music. I'm interested. There are some female vocalists that I'm listening to right now that I, I just can't get enough of hearing them. And so I, I, th- I think there's one of the great things about jazz is you never know, at least I never know enough about it. You know, there's always somebody else that I'm finding. You know, mm-hmm. interested in. So I love it. Now, you actually reference Sinatra in your book. Yeah. Are you a Sinatra yeah. fan at all? You know, I, I am. Um, my mother, uh, you know, we, we, we're so influenced by what we hear growing up, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother is a huge Sinatra fan. You know, while my dad was listening to classical music, my mother was listening to Sinatra. And he was not a Sinatra fan. I remember, <laughs> I remember that discussion around the house quite a bit. And I think Sinatra is great. I really do. And I, I think um, particularly in certain settings, it's, it's really wonderful. You know, it's, it's romantic music. It brings you back to a time period that I didn't really grow up in. I'm a little bit too young for that. But it brings you back to a period where things were probably a little simpler, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, we live in pretty complicated times. And whenever I think of Sinatra's music, I think about how simple things were back then. 
Now, considering that your book is titled All That Really Matters, do your characters actually figure out what really matters for them? I think so. I think so. I, um, I'm terrible, actually, at title <laughs> books. And don't worry, I, I think everybody is. <laughs> I know. I, I just can't. I don't know why I can't do it. So I have to have somebody that knows what they're doing, either at the publishing company or an agent or an mm-hmm. editor or somebody suggest a bunch of them to me and then I can pick one out, but I can't really do it on my own so well. And so when we were titling this one, and by we, I mean, publicist, agent, editor, etc., we were trying to figure out, you know, what is this protagonist really after? And somebody made the suggestion that he's trying to figure out what's really important in life. And I don't know if we can title a book, what's really important in life. <laughs> And so somebody came up, I don't even remember who it was, came up with all that really matters. And I said, yep, I think that's it. Let's roll. Let's roll with that. So it was really great. You know, when I'm writing books, I don't know about you or any of your listeners, but when I'm writing books, I make up some title that never even makes it close to being the actual title. Mm -hmm. You know, again, not my strong suit. Well, if it makes you feel any better, almost every author that I have talked to, the two things that they dread the most is writing the blurb and coming up with the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Those are like the banes of everybody's existence. Yeah, I guess the title ultimately is a marketing tool, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And maybe authors aren't particularly good at marketing their stuff. Some some seem to be, but maybe most aren't. I don't know. So well, that's the other thing. That's like whenever you ask somebody, what is the worst part about being an author? The answer is always marketing. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, the whole, I don't know how you feel about this, The whole thing is like two big phases, right? It's the Mm -hmm. writing and it's the marketing. Yeah. (laughs) I think both are really important. You know, it's a shame if you spend three years writing a book and no one reads it, right? Yeah. But at the same time, they're two different muscles. And I don't know that everybody is equipped to be able to do both of them well. (laughs) I don't know if anybody's equipped to do one of them well or most people, but it's certainly hard to do both of them well. If there was a world where... You just write the book and the marketing takes care of itself and you didn't have to get involved. I guess that would be okay with me. I actually have to tell you, your publicist website, PR by the Book, their webpage that they have for you and your novel, All That Really Matters, is fantastic. It just has everything that you need right there on the page. So easy to find. They are doing a good job for you. (laughs) Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. I don't also have a great way of evaluating whether anyone's doing a good job. It's just hard to know. Like I'm used to, you know, in the world I came from, we got a report card every time we transplanted a patient. I mean, Mm -hmm. I knew exactly how we were doing. And this is a little bit more nebulous because, you know, you, you don't really know if what you're doing is making any difference. You don't know if the book sales are going up or down. Uh, You know, it's not a very data rich world, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah especially for somebody that comes from a data-rich world. It's a little different. Now, this is the point of the show that we like to do five quick questions that never turn out to be quick, but I just like to continue doing it. (laughs) Are you ready? I think I'm ready, but it depends on the (laughs) questions. (laughs) So question one, considering that you had such a high-stress job, what do you do for self-care? You know, what I've relied on nearly all my life is exercise. Uh, Sometimes I over relied on it to the exclusion of everything else. But these days, uh, exercise, I meditate, talk to a therapist. I do it every week. I feel like we stigmatize talking to a therapist, but to me, it's like going to the gym for my brain, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, I have the luxury of being able to do that. And I think it's really important for me. That's actually something that we've talked about a lot this season is going to therapy. I am a very big proponent of going to therapy. I have done it periodically throughout my life. And I will honestly tell people, I think I have the healthy relationship with my husband now because I went to therapy before I met him. And I think it's just beneficial on so many levels for people to check into it. I do too. I I really do. I think it's kind of interesting that a lot of us are gym culture. We exercise, you know, we're always looking for the right food and the right this and the right that. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to therapy, it's like, oh no, I can't do that. Yeah. It's like, why? (laughs) (laughs) It's, you know, going to the gym for your brain. (laughs) Yeah. Question two, which do you prefer 
Ice cream or sherbet? Ice cream for sure. And what's your favorite flavor? Rocky Road. Really? Yes. Yes. And I'm afraid my pants size reflects that. So. <laughs> uh, yes. I like a good bowl of ice cream. I won't lie. End of the night. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so question three. What is your favorite thing about New Orleans? The music. I think actually New Orleans is such a culturally rich place. But for me, it's always going to be just the, the random guy standing on the corner blowing a horn. You mm -hmm. know, no audience, no nobody. It's almost like the city has a soundtrack to it. Yeah. You know, that somebody did a musical score for the whole thing. And I don't care. You know, I, I didn't live there for 26 years and then moved back. And it's always the same to me. It always has this background music that to me is the most important thing about being there. You know, there's other things that are incredible about it. The food, you know, the food is unbelievable. The architecture, the people are mm -hmm. fantastic. Real European in their zest for living, their spirituality. But to me, it's back to the music always. I have to admit, I really love the cemeteries just because of all the mausoleums. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. And Café du Mont. Yeah, yeah. I like Café du Mont, too. I used to go there when I was younger all the time, sometimes after a rough night out in the French Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that and coffee will wake you up. It'll definitely wake you up. And a, a beignet really hits the spot after a few drinks, I must yeah. say. <laughs> now, question four. Are you more of a dog person or a cat person? Oh, that's the easiest one all day. Uh, dog. I, I've had dogs all my life. I've got two currently, and I can't live without them. So that's an easy one. Is that Lucy and Franny? Yeah, Lucy and Franny are golden doodles. Oh, I love uh, those. Yeah, they're, they're really just fantastic. They go everywhere with us, and I've had to spend the occasional night without them when I travel and so forth, and don't like it. Not one bit. Yeah. Question five. What really matters to you? You know, there's three things that matter to me, and I've thought about this a lot. And fortunately, they all start with the same letter, so I can just say the three Fs. Mm -hmm. And it's not one of the Fs you're thinking. <laughs> um, um, it, it's really family, faith, and friends. Nice. You know, and, you know I, I think one thing I learned in doing this kind of work is I would ask people, you know, what would you do if today was your last day, you mm -hmm. know, if you couldn't get a transplant? And not one of them talked about, you know, work or success or money or whatever, you know, and the patients taught me that that's the only thing. Yeah. And so I try to connect with my family. I try to stay in touch with my friends. I, I, I kind of overtouch a lot of them, I think, because I'm calling them all the time if they don't live here and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And faith to me is not just necessarily a practice of a formal religion. But something deeper than that, you know, just helping one another out, just having some faith in humanity, trying to do the right thing, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so when I try to, when my life gets out of whack, I try to remember the three Fs and go back to it. So now let's remind everybody who you are and what is the title of your book. I'm David Weil. I'm the author of All That Really Matters, my debut novel. And where can they find your book? Wherever books are sold, you can go to davidweil.com and get links to all the usual booksellers. That's probably the easiest place to go to take your pick of where to buy the book. And you do have the first chapter available for a free download. I do. I've been telling everybody. The great thing about that is you can read it, and if you don't like it, I will never know. <laughs> so um, you just won't buy it. But I think, I think in reading the first chapter, you'll get a real flavor for what the book's about. I tried to set it up pretty well in the first chapter, and hopefully I've done that. And I love the back and forth between the two main characters. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah, it's funny how, you know, with fiction, you get to really like these characters a lot. You know, even when they're misbehaving, you like them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has been absolutely fabulous. I cannot thank you enough for doing this. I hope everybody takes a chance and goes and picks up all that really matters because it is so well written. I appreciate that, Diane. And thanks for having me. And thanks for the great questions. I know that it's hard work asking good questions. <laughs>
So there you have it, folks, my incredible interview with Dr. David Weil. Be sure to go check out his book, All That Really Matters, and his memoir, Exhale. You can find all of his information in the links in today's podcast. Now, next week on September 18th, we will have Jeannie McWilliams Blasberg, the author of Daughter of a Promise. You will not want to miss out. And if you're following along with Book Banter Magazine, we are getting ready to drop our next issue on October 1st. We're going to have some great Halloween reads for you, and then we're going to go into November with some great holiday gift ideas. We're gearing up for the end of the season, and so much more is coming. Be sure to keep watching everything that we're doing on our social media. Now, if you've been enjoying these podcasts, please consider sponsoring our work here. You can go to BurkhartBooks.com and buy a copy of Book Banter Magazine for just $2.99 for a digital download. It has all the live links so that you can go find all of the information on the fantastic authors we've been bringing to you. We're also currently working on bringing the magazine to you in print version as well. Keep watching our social media because they will be coming very soon. And I think that's going to be enough for today, folks. I'm actually getting ready to go on vacation next week, and I've got a lot to do to get ready. So, you know what time it is. It's time for you to go forth and try to be happy. <laughs>